Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a joy it is once again to come into your presence, knowing that you are the God who knows the end from the beginning. And therefore, you can mold history to fulfill your plan. We ask, Father, that as we study this great prophecy of Daniel 2, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to instruct us. Help us, Lord, to ad admire you more each day, because you are the God who knows the end from the beginning, all wise, omniscient, all powerful, eternal. Thank you for being a wonderful Father, and thank you for answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In the next two lectures, we are going to be dealing with some foundational material for what we are going to study in the rest of our seminar. We are now going to begin to transition to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, this evening, you're not going to see the connection of what we're talking about with the sanctuary. But believe me, what we're going to study tonight is foundational for what we're going to study tomorrow and very foundational for understanding Daniel 8, which specifically addresses the theme of the sanctuary. Now, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 2, which will be our chapter of study for today. The first thing that I want us to notice is that God knew what King Nebuchadnezzar was thinking when he laid down on his bed. God is able to read our thoughts. Here is a biblical evidence that God reads thoughts. It says there in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 29, here Daniel is speaking to the king, As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. What was Nebuchadnezzar thinking about when he went to bed? He was thinking about the future of his kingdom. Because it says here, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. Did God know what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking? He most certainly did. So God says to Nebuchadnezzar, so you're interested in knowing what is going to happen in the future? Okay, I'm going to give you a dream so that you understand what's going to happen in the future. And so in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, we have this dream or mention of the dream. It says there in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled that his sleep left him. So Nebuchadnezzar is thinking about the future of his kingdom. God knows what he's thinking. And so God says, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to give you a dream so that you have an answer to your concerns about the future. And so God gives Nebuchadnezzar this dream. But then Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, and he can't remember the dream. Notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 3. He says to the wise men of Babylon, And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. In other words, he woke up and he forgot the dream. Now who do you think led Nebuchadnezzar to forget his dream? It was God. You say, what possible purpose could God have in giving the king a dream and then the king waking up and God having him forget the dream? What possible purpose could there be in this? God had a purpose. You see, God knew that the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar would do would be to call the experts of Babylon to tell him his dream and what the dream meant. Is that exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did? He most certainly did. Notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, which by the way were the priestly caste of Babylon, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood 
before the king. Did God know that Nebuchadnezzar was going to call the astrologers and the magicians and the sorcerers to tell the king his dream? God knew it. What was God's purpose in leading Nebuchadnezzar to forget his dream? The purpose was that these individuals should appear before the king and they would not be able to tell the king his dream and everybody would see that the religion of Babylon was bankrupt. In other words, God wanted to unmask these so-called experts. He wanted to show that ma magic, astrology, sorcery does not work. And the only way to do this would be to give the king his dream and lead, lead the king to forget his dream so that he would call these so-called experts so that God could unmask them and show that the religion of Babylon was bankrupt. And that's exactly what happened. Notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 10. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. In other words, king, what you're asking is unreasonable. If you told us your dream, we would be able to tell you what the dream means. But you want us to tell you the dream itself. There's no individual who could ever do that on earth. And then I want you to notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 11. There was only one source that would be able to tell the king his dream. And what was that source according to the magicians? Daniel 2 and verse 11. It is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except whom? The gods, and there's three key words that I want us to notice here, the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Do you know what they're saying? They're saying the gods that we serve like to conceal. They like to keep secrets. And only if they should choose to reveal the dream could we know what the dream is. In other words, what they're saying is our gods conceal, they hide, they keep secrets. Let me ask you, is that the picture that you get from the God of the Bible? Absolutely not. Notice Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. You see, God is not a God who conceals, God is a God who reveals. God is not a God who keeps secrets. God is a God who reveals secrets. Notice Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He what? He reveals His what? His secret to His servants, the prophets. Notice Daniel 2 verse 29, which we already read. Let's read it again. Daniel 2 verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who what? Who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Is there a contrast between the pagan gods and the biblical God? Absolutely. The pagan gods, they have this information, but they conceal it, they hide it, they don't want to reveal it. But the God of the Bible is the God who reveals the secrets to his servants, the prophets. Now do you remember the three key words? Except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Can you think of another verse in the Bible that uses those three words? John chapter 1 and verses 1 and then verse 14. What does verse 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There you have one key word. And then verse 14 says, and the Word, who is God, was became what? There's a second key word, became flesh, and then what does it say? And what? And dwelt among us. Who is the great revealer of God's secrets? Jesus Christ, in person. 
And so it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me ask you, is the devil able to read our thoughts? No. Do you know how we know that? Because the devil was dying to tell the astrologers what the dream was, so that he could show that the religion of Babylon was true. And yet he was not able to do it. Now the devil, when he sees that God has unmasked his religion, he says, okay, what I'm going to do now is I am going to kill Daniel and I'm going to kill his three friends. Because the devil had already seen that these young men were a potential problem for, for him. Because in chapter 1, these three young men, along with Daniel, had been faithful to God in their eating and in their drinking. And so the devil says, these individuals are a potential problem for me. And so what I'm going to do now, God unmasked my religious leaders, but now I'm going to have them killed, and I'm going to have Daniel and his three friends killed too. And the problem is going to be solved. Notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 12. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Verse 13, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. And who did, whom did they seek? And they sought Daniel and his companions to what? To kill them. But God says to the devil, not so quick, buddy. You intend to kill Daniel and his three friends, but you know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring them into prominence in the kingdom by your attempt to kill them. <laughs> is that exactly what happened? Notice at the end of the story, Daniel chapter 2, verses 48 and 49, now Daniel and his three friends become famous in the kingdom. In other words, instead of being destroyed like the devil intended, God allowed them to be brought before the king so that they could occupy prominent positions in the kingdom and influence the kingdom for decades. Daniel chapter 2, verses 48 and 49. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So do you see what's happening here? We have a play and a counterplay. God knows what the king is thinking. He says, okay, I know what you're thinking. Here's a dream so that you know what's going to happen. And then when he wakes up, God says, forget the dream, because I want to unmask these charlatans. And so the, uh, the king calls these individuals, the religion of Babylon is unmasked, so the devil says, oh yeah, I'm going to kill your men. God says, no you're not, I'm going to bring them to prominence in the kingdom. There is a play and a counterplay that is taking place here between two forces, the force of good and the force of evil, between God and Satan. Now let me ask you, what method did God use to show Daniel the dream? He said to Daniel, Daniel, Wait until it's nighttime, and you can go out and look at the stars. He said, Daniel, go before the king and tell him to show you the palm of his hand. No. He said, Daniel, go to a medium and have the medium try to conjure up the dead. No. How did God reveal his secret to his prophet? Notice Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Daniel 2, 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which are the Hebrew names, by the way, his companions, that they might, what? Might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this, what? Ah, see, there's that word secret again. Concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. What method did Daniel use 
for God to reveal his secret concerning the future? He used prayer. If we want to know what's in store for our life, what do we use? We don't go visit astrologers. We don't go to a palm reader. We don't look at the signs of the zodiac. We don't go to consult the supposed spirits of the dead. We pray to God that God will reveal his secret to us. You know, history is like a game of chess. Some of you have heard this comparison before. You know, there's this chess board. On one side of the table, God is seated. And on the other side of the table, Satan is seated. And the movements of the pawns on the board are the movements of history. And so God says to Satan, your move. And so the devil moves in history, and then God says, ha ha, you moved. My turn. And so God moves to counteract what the devil has done. And so history develops as a play and a counterplay. Satan trying to interrupt God's plans and God implementing his plans. Now let me ask you, is the devil playing at a disadvantage? Yeah. He most certainly is. If you could play a game of chess, where you already knew all of the moves that the other player was going to make, <laughs> How much of a chance would there be that you could lose? Absolutely none. If you knew all of the moves that the other player was going to make, there's no way you could lose. See, the devil has to guess how God is going to play. But God knows every move that the devil is going to make, and therefore he can take measures to counteract the moves that the devil wants to make in human history, because God knows the end from the beginning. Now let's talk about the dream. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Daniel 2 and verse 31. Here Daniel says to the king, You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. And then you have the dream itself. Beginning with verse 32, it says the image's head was a fine gold. Use your imagination. You have a handout that has the sequence, but use your imagination now. The image's head was a fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver. Its belly and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So you have gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron and clay. And then notice verse 34. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so we have several important symbols in this passage. We have a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and then you have a stone that is cut out of a mountain without hand, and it comes and it strikes the image on its feet, and then the stone becomes a gigantic mountain that fills the whole earth. Now there's a very important point that I need to underline, and that is that there are no gaps in the historical flow that we find in Daniel chapter 2. Because there are some Christians that are saying, in fact many Christians that are saying, that there's a gap between the legs and the feet. And that gap has lasted 1,900 years so far. But there's no evidence in this dream that there are any parentheses or gaps or lapses in the sequence of powers. The sequence of powers flow one right after the other without interruption. Now I want you to notice 
the interpretation of this dream, because later on in the chapter we have what the dream means. Go with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verses 37 and 38. Daniel 2, 37 and 38. Now we're going to see how Daniel interpreted the dream or explained the dream. Here Daniel says, You, O king, are a king of kings. Why was Nebuchadnezzar such a great king? Well, because he had better weapons than anybody else. He had more powerful armies. He had more money. He was more intelligent. Absolutely not. Notice what it says. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. Why was Nebuchadnezzar king? Because it was God's will that Nebuchadnezzar be king. God placed Nebuchadnezzar there. Who is in control of human history? God is in control of human history. Now notice the, the last part of this verse 38. It says, He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. And now listen carefully. You are this head of gold. Does this prophecy clearly explain what the head of gold represents? Absolutely. What is the head of gold? The head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar. But what was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom? His kingdom was Babylon. You see, in prophecy we're going to notice that king and kingdom are used interchangeably. In fact, let's go to the next verse and you're going to see it very, very clearly. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38. It has just said in verse uh, 38, uh, the, the la first part of the verse, uh, uh, verse 38, it says, You are this head of gold. But now notice, I believe it says, it's in verse 39, not verse 38. It says, but after you shall arise another what? Another kingdom. So is the head of gold a kingdom? Sure, because it says, after you will arise another kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king of a kingdom. The head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. And after the kingdom of Babylon, there was going to be what? Another kingdom inferior to yours. And then notice, it says, then another, a third kingdom of what? Of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So how many kingdoms so far? We have three kingdoms. The first kingdom is what? Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. The second kingdom is which kingdom? The Medes and Persians came immediately after Babylon. They conquered Babylon. And then after the Medes and Persians, which kingdom rises? Greece. Now listen to what I'm going to say. You don't even have to go to the history books to know that the first three kingdoms are Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. All you have to do is study the book of Daniel. Daniel has the names of all three, which means that it's easy to identify kingdom number four. You say, now how's that? Does the Bible tell us which kingdom conquered Babylon? Yeah. Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar was the king. And Darius the Mede, he's also called Darius the Mede, came and he conquered Babylon. The troops of the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon. So we know what the second kingdom is. It is Medo-Persia. And then in Daniel 8, which we're going to study later on in this seminar, after Medo-Persia, it says that the kingdom that would arise would be Greece. Greece is mentioned by name. And so in Daniel itself, even without going to the history books, you know that the first kingdom is Babylon, you know that the second kingdom is Medo-Persia, and you know that the third kingdom is what? The third kingdom is Greece. Is that clear? Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. You say, well, what would the fourth kingdom be? Well, if you've identified the first three that come one right after another without parentheses, without any interruption, it's easy to identify the fourth. Which kingdom conquered the kingdom of Greece? It was Rome, the Roman Empire. Let's read Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. It says here, 
and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong, remember that word, shall be as strong as iron. That word strong is a key word. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Is that a fit description of Rome? It most certainly is. In fact, uh, the great uh, historian Edward Gibbon wrote the five-volume set called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and he calls Rome the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Interesting, because he was not a church historian, he was a secular historian, and yet he's calling Rome the Iron Monarchy of Rome. So very clearly the first four kingdoms are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. But now I want you to notice what we come to in the feet. This is what I want to dwell on most in our seminar today. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, that is this fourth kingdom, shall be what? Divided. Yet the strength, there you have the word strong. You remember the, the word strong with regards to the fourth kingdom? Now it says here, the strength of the what? Of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, which is the strong part, by the way? Is it the, the iron part or the clay part? It's the iron part that's strong. And so it says in verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of potter's clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, which is the iron part, and partly what? Fragile. What is the fragile part? It is the clay part. Now let's take a look at these verses. Very important verses. How many toes do two normal feet have? And the reason I use the word normal is because I've asked the question, I say, how many toes do two feet have? Some people say, well, it all depends if somebody's had a toe amputated or not. And so I say, how many toes do two normal feet have? They have ten what? Ten toes. Which means that the fourth kingdom was going to be what? The fourth kingdom was going to be divided into ten kingdoms. You say, how do we know that? It's very simple. Is there iron in the feet? Was there iron in the legs? What did the iron in the legs represent? The Roman Empire. What does the iron in the feet then represent? It must represent the fact that the Roman Empire, what? Continues, but it continues how? In a divided state, it's divided into ten nations. Are you with me or not? It's going to be divided into ten nations. In other words, this fourth kingdom was going to fall apart. It was still going to be Rome because you have iron in the feet, but it was going to be a divided Rome. But then I want you to notice that to the iron in the feet is added another strange element. What is added to it? A special kind of clay. Potter's clay. Question, what existed before? The iron or the clay? Iron. The iron existed before. So the iron continues in the feet, and then what is added to the iron? Afterwards, the clay is added to the iron. Now let me ask you this. Is this a different kind of Rome in the feet? Yes, it is. Because first of all, it is a Rome that is divided into many what? Into many nations. But secondly, it is an amalgamated Rome. Do you understand what the word amalgamated means? It is a Rome that is a mixture not only of the iron, it's not political Rome alone anymore. There's another element that is mixed or blended or amalgamated with it. 
Now let me ask you, is this a legitimate or illegitimate union? It's illegitimate. Who in his right mind would actually join iron and clay? They're two totally different elements, aren't they? Totally different. There's no way that you can amalgamate them or mix them and have the result be strong. The clay is good as clay, and the iron is good as iron. The problem is when you what? Is when you put them together or you mix them. Now, are we dealing with symbols in Daniel chapter 2? Is the gold a symbol? Is the silver a symbol? Is the bronze a symbol? Is the iron a symbol? Is the stone a symbol? Is the mountain a symbol? But the potter's clay, that's not a symbol. It would have to also be what? It would also have to represent or symbolize something. Because Rome is going to be divided, and it's going to be a different kind of Rome. It's going to be an amalgamated Rome. So we need to know what the clay represents, because we already know that the iron represents the political power of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire will continue as a political entity divided, but there will be clay added to it. So we need to know what the Bible means by potter's clay. Now let's examine some passages of Scripture that explain what the potter's clay is. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 18 and verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Listen carefully. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of what? Clay. clay. What kind of clay? Potter's. potter's clay, yes, was marred in the hand of the potter. So what did the potter do? So he made it again into what? Into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Now what is represented by the fact that this that this uh, vessel was made from potter's clay by the potter, it broke, and then the potter made it all over again as a new vessel. The fact is that Jeremiah is here describing the Babylonian captivity. And if you want a text that proves that, Jeremiah 19 verse 11, which we don't have time to read, uses the same terminology of the potter to refer to the captivity of Israel when they were taken by Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, God formed Israel at Mount Sinai as his people, but because of the apostasy they broke. And God, after 70 years, what did he do? He restored Israel once again to their land. Are you with me? So he made the vessel what? Again. Now, we don't have to guess at this, because notice the explanation is given there in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What does the potter's clay represent? It represents God's people, God's Old Testament church. It represents, in other words, it represents a religious institution, God's Old Testament church, Israel. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And you're not going to see the connection immediately with this, but you're going to see it in a few moments. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Speaking about the creation of man. And notice what it says. And the Lord God, what's the next word? Formed. What was God? God was the what? The potter. I'm going to prove it to you. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. How many of you have ever tried to form anything out of dust? You can't. But see, this was wet dust. This was really potter's clay. We're going to read another text in a moment. 
So it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. What faculty of man was made out of dust? His physical body, right? His body. Did that body have, uh, have all of its different members, arms, legs, heart, lungs, stomach, uh, fingers, nose, mouth, that it had all of the different members or parts. Absolutely. It was a perfect body with all of its members. But it was a lifeless body. Notice I didn't say a dead body. It was a lifeless body. What was lacking? The breath of God or the spirit of life. And so it continues saying, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? A living being. Did every member now start functioning? Did the heart start beating? Did the lungs start breathing? Did the stomach start digesting once uh, Adam and Eve started eating? Of course. Did their fingers start moving? Did they start walking? Yes, now that the body was all together as one with many members, and the spirit entered the body, now all of the member, members functioned in perfect unity. Now, notice Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. Here is where the Bible tells us that God, when he created man, he did it like a potter. It says there, and you might want to write down, this isn't on your list, Isaiah 45 verse 9 uses the same terminology. Isaiah 45 verse 9. It says in Isaiah 64 verse 8, But now, O Lord, you are what? Our Father. We are the, we are the clay, and you our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. So what did God form man out of? Clay. What kind of clay? Potter's clay, right? And then what did he do? He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and now man became a living soul. In other words, every member of his body started what? Functioning. Now, this is talking about the literal creation of man. But this literal creation of man has a symbolic meaning as well. You say, what do you mean a symbolic value? Because in Daniel 2, we're not dealing with the literal, we're dealing with what? We're dealing with symbols. Now let me ask you, what is the body of Christ? Symbolically speaking or spiritually speaking? The body of Christ is the church. Notice Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Speaking about Jesus, it says, And he is the what? The head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So what is the body of Christ? The body of Christ is the church. Who created the church? Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. So who was it that created his body? Jesus created the church. He created the body. In what condition was that body before the day of Pentecost? Did they all come together? The Bible says that they were all of one what? One accord. But what was still lacking? What didn't the body have yet? The body did not have the breath. So what happened on the day of Pentecost? Acts chapter 2 and verses 2 through 4. It says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all what? filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By the way, they not only spoke in tongues, all of the gifts of the Spirit now came alive in the church. Are you catching the picture? Now we're dealing with symbols. In Genesis 2 verse 7, you have the literal creation of literal man. But that represents, that's representative, it's symbolic of the church of Jesus Christ, which He created out of potter's clay, so to speak, and then he gave it what? The Holy Spirit, the breath of life. Let me ask you, did the body now start functioning? Did every member of the body start fulfilling its function? Yes, and, and you know what? I'm not inventing this illustration. The apostle this illustration. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 12 and 13. 
Very clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that what? One body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into what? One body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Question them. What does the potter's clay represent? We noticed in Jeremiah that the potter's clay represents what? God's people. Israel. What does the body represent in the New Testament? What does the potter's clay represent in the New Testament? It represents the body of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, which is his what? His church. So what does the potter's clay represent? It represents the church. Are you with me? Now there's one other illustration where you can see that uh, the potter's clay represents the church. You remember that vision that Ezekiel had of the valley of the dry bones? And there were body parts strewn all over the body. And then God called upon all of the parts of the body to come together through Ezekiel. And then what did God give those bodies? He gave those bodies what? The breath of life, His Spirit. And they stood up. What is represented by all of the parts of the body coming together and the Spirit coming into the body? Ezekiel 37 makes it very clear. Notice Ezekiel 37 verses 10 and 11. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, that is the body, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Are you catching the picture? Are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. So the potter's clay represents the church. So what was going to happen during the period of the feet of the image when the Roman Empire was divided, there was going to be a union of what? Of church and state. Are you following me? In other words, during the period of the feet, you were not only going to have an empire, it was going to be an empire that united church and state. Remember this, because we're going to come back to this tomorrow when we study Daniel chapter 7. Now listen. Revelation 17 presents the same idea, but with different symbols. Go with me to Revelation chapter 17, and this is speaking about the end time. Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 and 2. Different symbols, same meaning, union of church and state. It says here, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. What does a woman represent in prophecy? Represents the church. If it's a pure woman, what kind of church are we talking about? A pure church. We talked about the woman of Revelation 12, remember? Represents God's faithful church. Now if it's a harlot woman, what kind of church are we talking about? We're talking about a church that is apostate. Now how did she become a harlot? How did the church become a harlot? How did she become a fornicating woman? Well, let's continue reading. It says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And now comes the explanation of how the church became a harlot. With whom, what? The kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. How should, did she become an adulterous harlot? Because she committed fornication with whom? With the kings of the earth. Is this a union of church and state? Yeah. It most certainly is a union of church and state. Does the church have a right to exist as church? Yes. Does the state have its function as state? Absolutely. Where does the problem come in? The problem comes in when the union is illegitimate because the church is supposed to be married only to whom? To Jesus Christ. Jesus is the husband and the church is his bride. So what happens when the church starts trying to get the kings of the earth to do what Jesus Christ should be doing? 
the church becomes adulterous. The church becomes a harlot. Is that exactly what happened when the Roman Empire fell apart? Did a church arise that used the power of political power of Rome to persecute those who were not in harmony with the church? Yes or no? Absolutely. It can be proven from history. Now you knew I wasn't going to go through this whole presentation without reading from Ellen White. <laughs> the little old lady knew this all the time. And she didn't go through all the study, all the biblical study we've gone through. See, you know, you can go to the internet and you'll find all kind of trash about Ellen White. Don't even bother to read it. They're the same old rehashed arguments that come out all the time. Nitpicking little thing here and little thing there. Listen, in scripture you also have little details that appear to be discrepancies. For example, one gospel says that there was one demon possessed man and the other says that there were two. Say, whoo, you can't trust the Bible because one says one and the other says two. Listen, if you're going to let, let that shake your faith, then you're never going to come to believe. The fact is that little details like this make no difference. It's the big picture. And the more I read Ellen White and I see how she's in harmony with Scripture, I marvel. Not because she's another Bible, not because she takes the place of the Bible, not because she knows more than the Bible, not because she brings more doctrines that are not in the Bible, but because she explains and amplifies and simplifies what is in the Bible. Now listen to this statement. It's found in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1168. She said this, We have come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image. She says, we're now in that time. In which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. And then she says this, God has a people, a chosen people, whose discernment must be sanctified, who must not become unholy by laying upon the foundation wood, hay, and stubble. Every soul who is loyal to the commandments of God will see that the distinguishing feature of our faith is the Seventh-day Sabbath. And then she says this, if the government would honor the Sabbath, and when she says honor the Sabbath, it doesn't mean that they legislate to make the Sabbath the day of rest. It means that they respect God's right, the people of, uh, of God's right to keep the Sabbath and guarantee that right, like in the First Amendment to the Constitution. She says, if the government would honor the Sabbath as God has commanded, it would stand in the strength of God and in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints. But statesmen will uphold the spurious Sabbath and will mingle the religious faith with the observance of this child of the papacy, placing it above the Sabbath which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people to a thousand generations. And now comes the key portion of the statement. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing of the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. Isn't that a remarkable statement? It's an amazing statement in the light of what we studied from Scripture. Now we can't end without talking about the mountain and the stone. What does the mountain represent? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. This is the climax of this dream. Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. This is the dream itself. In a moment, we're going to read the interpretation of what this means. It says there in Daniel 2, 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. We'll come back to that in a moment. Which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now what does this mean, the mountain that fills the whole earth? In the explanation of this dream, in verse 44, we have what this means. 
Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. It says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up what? Will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, there's not going to be any more kingdoms. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand what? It shall stand forever. So the mountain represents Christ's everlasting kingdom that fills the whole earth. But now the question is, how is that kingdom established? Well, here we come to the stone. See, the stone has to do something. To destroy the kingdoms of the world so that this stone can become the mountain that fills the whole earth. Go with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 45, and I want you to notice an interesting detail about this stone. It says, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and broke it, uh, and broke it in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So you have a stone and it says that the stone is cut out of, out of the mountain. How? Without hands. Now what does that stone represent? Go with me to Matthew 21 verse 42. And this is only one verse of many that I could read from the New Testament. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42, this is the conclusion of a parable that Jesus gives of the vineyard workers. We'll come back to this parable in our lecture this coming Saturday, Sabbath morning. Matthew 21 verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. To whom was Jesus referring when he spoke about the stone that the builders rejected? He was talking about himself. So what does the stone of Daniel chapter 2 represent? It represents Jesus Christ. Now notice that we're told here that this stone was cut out of the mountain. How? Without hands. What does that mean, without hands? Let's go to two verses that explain it. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. Let's see what not with hands means. It says there, speaking about the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary compared to the earthly sanctuary, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Which tabernacle is that? Which is the greater and more perfect tabernacle? It's the heavenly sanctuary. Who built the earthly sanctuary? Moses. Was it built by human hands? Absolutely. But notice, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more, more perfect tabernacle, not made with what? With hands. That is not of this creation. You know, there's this idea among Christians that we need to take over the world. We need to use the power of the state to establish Christ's kingdom in the United States. We need to return to the good old days when this was a Christian nation. You know, the best way to make a, this a Christian nation is not by appealing to President Obama to do it. It's by having the church go out and under the power of the Holy Spirit preach the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. That's the mission to which God has called the church. God has not called the church to go to Washington, D.C. and lobby for the state to do what the church should be doing. Amen. Besides, the state never changes hearts. It's the Holy Spirit through the power of the gospel preached by the church that brings a change to the human heart. In other words, the kingdom of Christ will not be established by men within history. It will be established from outside of human history by a miracle of God. It is not of this creation. Amen. Notice one more text, Math, uh, Mark chapter 14 and verse 58. Mark chapter 14 and verse 58. Here Jesus is talking about his uh, own body. You know, who, who uh, brought the body of Jesus into existence when he became incarnate? Mary, right? He was born from Mary. 
like we're born from women. But what about the resurrected body of Jesus? Oh, that body was given by a miracle of God, by the Father. It says in Mark 14, verse 58, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, that's the temple that they had built and Herod had remodeled, and within three days I will build another made without hands. That means without human intervention, by a divine miracle of God. How is Christ's kingdom going to be established on this earth? It will not be by men maneuvering within history to establish a golden age. It will come from outside of human history, a miraculous stone, Jesus Christ, that will establish his everlasting kingdom. Now listen carefully. We have a choice that we need to make. We can either, either decide to fall on that stone and be converted, or that stone will fall on us and crush us. See, this is all fine and dandy. We're talking about empires and kingdoms, but what about us personally? Let's finish by reading Matthew chapter 21 and verse 44. I believe Jesus is referring here to this prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. He says there in verse 44, whoever falls on this stone, he's talking about himself, whoever's heart is broken and is converted will be broken. But now notice, but on whomever it falls, it will what? It will grind him to powder. So the plea of God with us is to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. To fall on the stone so that he breaks our selfish heart. And in this way, when Jesus comes, we'll be in his kingdom. The stone will not destroy us, but the stone will save us. Amen.